You go to Berkeley, man. Y'all pay $70,000. You're supposed to know that song.
first knew about him through uh, some records that I heard of Roy Hargrove when they got his record of Cannonball and Woody back in high school days. Uh, one of the reasons I came to Berkeley, he was we went here, did music ed, um, same thing I did, um, following everything that he's been doing. Uh, and now he's uh, faculty at Queens College, full professor there. Uh, for I just found out for 20 years, which is he's a young man. He's putting his time in there. Um, but how about a huge round of applause for Mr. Antonio? <laughs> I'll speak in this because I guess they're streaming, and I, I have a cold, guys. I, I apologize. Um, I was in Asia and hanging out with this little kid that's like my little nephew, and he was hacking and coughing on me, and he got me. But um, I'm, I'm really happy to um, to be here with you guys. And what I would like for this to be is for us to have a discussion, um, for us to to have a you know just a, a real um, interplay with each other because I was here where you guys are. Now, you know, I started at Berkeley when I was 17, not knowing anything, and I would come to these master classes and be afraid to ask questions, you know. There's no such thing as a wrong question. The only, the only wrong question is the one that you don't ask. You know, I have like about 30 years of experience on the scene, education, and playing with a lot of people, so use the time that you have with me. Ask me any question. It's an open book, okay? Now, let's start that again. I need you guys to talk to me. I need us to be engaged, right? The difference between me and you is this. I'm not here and you're there. It's this. We're all on the same playing field. I just had a little bit more time on the earth, but I do have experiences that I want to share with you because if I can make your road a little shorter than mine or straighter than mine, then my job has been successful. But I need you guys to be with me. So let's try that again. Are we going to be cool together? Okay, I'll take that. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna just gonna play something. Just to you know, I just met my my new little brothers and sisters. We're gonna play us one of my compositions, and then we'll just open it up. All right, if we have some saxophone players that want to play. In fact, I want to hear you guys. So get your horns out and ready. Clarinet too. I saw it.
to get a little hot and just um, turn all the trouble off for me, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so that was a composition that I wrote a long time ago. Um, it was it's called uh, Forward Motion. And, you know, after playing for, for years with Dave Holland, you know, nothing we played in, in all those bands. I played in um, the quintet. I was up for Chris Potter. And then we had the sextet, we had the octet, and we had the big band. Nothing was ever in four. Like, and it was funny because the whole front row would be all musicians and everybody's sitting there like, what time was that in? I'm like, I don't know, did it swing? Did it feel good? You know, but anyway, uh, that was in multimeters as you heard and the, 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 the trick of it is just try not to feel it that way, just to feel it like it's a four or a three because that's all it is anyway. It's either three or two, just a combination of that. Of that. These guys play really well. This is the first time I'm playing with, give them a hand. That's really not enough. These are your classmates. How about Kento on the piano? Kento on the piano. Gone on the bass. Roni? Roni on the drums. I was messing with those guys because um, I went to Israel a long time ago. Uh, it's a saxophone player named Walter Blandon who plays with Winton. And he was living over there. He was actually living in a kibbutz for a while. And um, he invited me over to Israel, and we played at this club called Camelot. It was on Beni Huda, right? And um, I went there. I've been to Israel about seven to eight times. And some of the, well, it's the best hummus in the world. I haven't found anywhere better than Israel for hummus. In New York, it sucks. But um, I'm, so I'm always happy when I see my brothers and sisters coming from Israel. They have such a great tradition of jazz over there from Jerusalem. And so, you know, you guys are part of the next generation. So I'm, I'm really happy. You know, and uh, some Israelis here. And uh, can't leave Japan out. I've been going to Japan for about 30 years, and, um, you know, I, I really love your country. You know, um, so many great musicians and people that I've gone to school here, Junko Onishi and Matsuhiko Osaka, and, and so many so many great um, musicians that have studied here at Berkeley. You guys are so fortunate. You, you, don't, you don't get it now, probably while you're here, but some of these people that you're in class with are going to be the people that you play with in the future and that you're going to network with. So it's important to build relationships. Everything that we do is relationships. I don't care how great a musician you are, because there's a lot of great musicians in New York, and um, Professor Smith will tell you that aren't working. You know, they can play their butts off, but they're, because they're not nice people. Why do you want to deal with somebody that's not nice? I don't care how good you are. You know, if I if I have to go to, I just came back from Taiwan. If I have to go to the to the airport and I have to worry about you showing up one time, that's too much stress. If you're complaining about this, that, and that, you don't learn my music, you don't dress correctly. You know. I don't want to deal with you. I'd rather get somebody 
that's not maybe at your caliber, but it's going to give me everything I want, and we're going to have a good time. So that's probably the most important thing I can say to you guys is to be a professional, you know, and build relationships. Be good people. Be confident, but be good people, you know. If somebody hires you for a gig and you say, I want to do this gig, you do everything they ask you to do. You know, you learn that music. Don't show up at the rehearsal learning that music. Learn the music before you get there. Show them that you appreciate it. Show up and look good. You know, a lot of the cats, Glasper and those guys that I knew at the new school, they come in their jeans and stuff. I'm from an old, I'm, a, I'm, I'm old school. I like suits, you know. I, I look hip, right? Check me out. Come on. No. <laughs> you know, I, this music for me has to have a certain level of reverence, you know, but every, every generation expresses themselves the way they do, so I don't have a problem with that. But when, I, when I'm hired for something like when Professor Smith asked me to come here, I wasn't going to come here in some jeans and T-shirt, you know. That, that's just not how I operate. So relationships. You're supposed to be a virtuoso on your instrument. That goes without saying. Times have changed, guys, so if you think you're just going to get a record contract and become a star, it might happen. But, you know, the record industry has totally changed. You know, the, the whole touring around the world has changed for a lot of reasons in current events. I'm sure if you study that, you know what's going on. But Europe is not the same. Asia is not the same. And you have to figure out ways to, to have the career that you want as a musician and also to make a living. So you have to be thinking smart. You have to be thinking that you're a business. You're, you're a business, and you have to prove to people that they have to hire you because you're the best that they're going to get. There's a million saxophone players and trumpet players and everything that's out there, but there's only one you, and you got to prove to them that you're the special person that they want to hire. You know, That's why my phone rings all the time. I get students, and people call me for gigs. I don't call it because I've built a reputation over 30 years. They know what they're going to get when they call Antonio Hart. And because of the relationships, my relationship with Roy Hargrove, God rest him, you know. So we met here at Berkeley. We met at Wally's. We met at Wally's. I remember the first time it, he was coming to Berkeley. We had heard about Roy. He was, like, already famous, right? He was, like, 17 years old, like this wonder kid. And we were, we were the kids. We were the cats at Berkeley, right? You know, we had our chest in the air. So well, who's this trumpet player? Yeah, tell him to come down to Wally's. So Roy comes down. He has on his jacket, a tweed jacket. He has on sunglasses. It was, like, 12 o'clock at night. He has this um, box of cigarettes, like these European cigarettes. He comes in. Yeah, baby, y'all sound good. You know, can I play? We're like, yeah, bring your horn up here. And Roy played, and we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> End of story. And, you know, I miss him so much, but, you know, because of our relationship here, he asked me to join his band, and the rest is history. Um, so this, this place is actually very special for me in terms of meeting so many great, great musicians. And my teachers, Bill Pierce, who just retired, and the great Andy McGee and Joe Viola. You know, I owe Berkeley so much um, for allowing me a chance to grow. And that's why I'm here with you guys today. So what I, what I would like to happen, we can, we can play. I, I love to play. But I would like for you guys to just use me as a resource for anything. You know, I've been in academia for 20 years. I've played with Art Blakey and Dizzy Gillespie and all these different people. So if, you're, if this is what you really want to do, you need to ask me questions. I would hope you ask me questions. I would hope you ask me some questions. Yes, sir. When when I choose people to play with me, like I'm actually the, the pianist that plays with me was one of my graduate students. Her name is Mickey Yamanaka. Um, she was actually one of my worst students at the college. <laughs> she, but she was always at Smalls playing every night, you know. And I watched her. You know, I, I knew academia wasn't her thing, but she wanted to play. And so once I got a chance to hear her and arrange, and I saw how serious she was, I just brought her in, you know, based on the talent that she has. And then it's my job to groom her to tell her what I want, how I want her to comp how I want her to play behind me harmonically, things that I do, so we're on the same page. So, and it's like, like when you choose to play with anybody, you, you, you choose them because you just feel the vibe. And that's very important for me, the energy, the spirit of the person. And then um, you see what 
how, how the people can gel together. And then you just experiment. You know, Miles Davis told Herbie and those guys, Herbie and, and Ron Carter and Tony Williams, um, Herbie Hancock, I hate saying like Herbie or Bird. I don't, it's Charlie Parker. Yeah, I don't know him. But um, he told them, I'm paying you to experiment on the bandstand. You know, so that's kind of what we do at this point. We, we, we go into our rehearsals. We have a, an outline of what we're doing. But then I hired you because I want you to do what you do. And if I hear something that's contrary to my vision, then I'll make comments, but very little. You know, I choose people that I like. Again, it goes back to relationships. You know, I choose people that I know you love the music. You don't like music. You love music. I love music. You know, it's, it's something that I do for free, but I'm thankful I get paid for it, <laughs> you know? But I love music, and those are the people that I want to be around, you know? Did I answer your question? Come on, guys, let's rap. I'm going to just stop picking you randomly. I'm a, I'm a teacher, so I know how to do this. All right, you. Dave Holland, um, through my, my uh, big brother, Robin Eubanks. You know Robin Eubanks, the trombone player? Um, actually, the first time I saw Robin Eubanks was in, uh, what's that, the Mass Ave building? The where they had all the saxophone lessons, Boyston, Boyston Street. Um, we, we used to do recitals and master classes in that building. And uh, Robin Eubanks gave a master class. And at that time, there was a style of music called M bass that was really popular with um, Steve Coleman and Gary Thomas and things like that. So, you know, when I moved to New York, I was just trying to find all of these cats that I that I love. So Robin became a really good friend and, like I said, a mentor. And uh, he told Dave about me. And uh, actually, Dave called me like maybe ten years before to do a tour, and I was—I think I was out with, with when I was with Papa Nat, Nat Adderley, and I couldn't do it. And he didn't call me again. I was like, "Damn, I blew this opportunity." And then he called me again to go to China. It was 1998. Some of you guys were probably born around that time or close to it. And um, it was supposed to be the quintet. Chris was um, with uh, Paul Motion, and so it was supposed to be the quintet with me. And then Robin couldn't do the tour. So I had to go to China and play the Dave Holland Quartet. And the, the, the part that was eerie about it was Chris was there standing in the back because he was playing with Paul Motion. And I'm like sitting there like, and I didn't know anything about odd meter music. What I did was, and this, is, and this is the truth, Dave gave me the CD for four months. Every day, I just sat and played with the CD every day and learned those compositions. So when I got on the band stand, I was, I was cool, you know. So um, that, that's how I met um, met Dave, and he's, he was a, or he is a great mentor. It's just been a pleasure to play in all his ensembles because he, he really opened up my vision about music and some of the concepts that I've um, put into my music. Yes, sir. Your body's your temple. You know, I, I chose not to uh, partake in any of that, those activities, because I didn't want to be that stereotype of what they think a musician, especially um, jazz musicians. Yes, I've been around it, and um, it's unfortunate that, you know, once that, that monkey or bug hits you, some people can't get away from it. And I think we, we should use those guys as examples of things we don't want to do. You know, a lot of brilliant Musicians have left the earth earlier than I, I would have wanted them to leave, but that's all in God's plan. But, you know, it's, guys, you got to take care of yourself. Like, I, I'm a martial artist. You know, I, I've been studying martial arts for, for many, many years, and that's how I keep myself together. I'm pretty much close to vegetarian, but that's, that's just a life choice, you know. Um, drink moderately wine and sock, sake. <laughs> you know, but um, I don't smoke. I don't do any of those things. Um, and, you know, I can't tell you what to do with your body, but you only have one. And what, what I can tell you, I know guys that were heavily into drugs that have survived, and it comes back to you. It never leaves you. So they start to have problems later on because of what they did earlier in their lifetime. So um, you're going to be around it. You're going to be tempted 
you know, people going to, I was called the square. I was the college boy. When I came to New York, oh, that's the college boy because I got out of Berkeley. And, you know, people, why are you reading those books? Why are you doing it? Because I want, I want knowledge. Oh, you, you know, you're going to get your master's. You know, those that can, can play and those that can't teach. No, it's not that. It's just like I wanted a different quality of life. You know, and like I said, I wanted to be an example of a high caliber musician that lived a certain kind of lifestyle. You know, so um, that's a great question because I know that that is here at the college and, and you're going to be exposed to that. And it's your choice whether you choose to do it, but it's your temple and you, don't, you only have one. Take care of it. Love it. Yes, sir. Oh, let's get him. Well, when I when I first started, I went to a performing arts high school in, in Maryland. Um, who went here? That went there. Well, uh, Warren Warren uh, Warren Wolf went to, went to my high school. Lee Pearson drums, Tim Green, another saxophone player, Mark Gross, who was older than me. Had several people from the Baltimore School for the Arts, um, and it was a classical music program when I was there. So I was trained playing European classical music. I didn't, I didn't even do jazz. When I, when I auditioned for Berkeley, I, paid a, I played a piece called the Constantina de Cameron, the Iber. And they were like, why do you want to come here? I was like, I want to learn how to play jazz, you know? I, 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 I kind of knew, like, now's the time from the Omni book, and I had the spirit. But, I, I, you know, where you guys are, by the time you got here, when I got here, I didn't know anything. I was in the lowest ensembles, everything. I was just, like, the lowest person on the totem pole. You know, so what I would do, I, I, I'll finish your question. What I would do was um, when I got to Berkeley, I said, I want to know who the best players are. I don't care who came in with me. I was like, who are the best players? And you had like Sam Newsom and Javon Jackson and, you know, Tony Tewitt, he passed away. These were the, the guys, I think, um, Delphio Marcellus and Julian Joseph piano. And I would just like shadow these people. Like they would be in the Mass Ave building, like cats be like talking to girls in the corner. I'd be behind the trash can like. You know, or they would, you know, they would have sessions. You guys still have sessions where you sign out of room and you can have sessions. So they would have sessions and I would just knock on people's door. Like, can I play? Can I get a tune? Can I get a tune? And then I go to Wally's and, and I would practice like, you know, 12, 13 hours a day. And I always had headphones. So I couldn't talk to people. I didn't have any social skills because all I was, I was tonal vision. I was like, and I would go to sing a showcase. Y'all still have those sing a showcase? I said, that's going to be me on the stage. I'm going to be in those bands. And within two years, Whenever, when Dizzy Gillespie came, when Jack Dijanek, whenever anybody came, I was in that band. You know, it was just, I just had that vision. I wanted to play. I wanted to be a part of the best. But to answer your question, um, my practice routine, I practice fundamentals. And when I go in the practice room, I practice. I don't go in there to sound good, you know? So I start off with long tones. You can't escape long tones. Then I do my, my thirds, my trads and inversions. I do my, my scales. I do any kind of harmonic thing that I'm working on, you know? Or I'll, I'll play a lot of classical etudes. I like, I like the Furlings 48 etude books. I, I've been playing that for years, but I still do it. The Close book or whatever I can get my hands on. I, I, I play those, um, all those Marcel Mule books, you know? Um, and then maybe I'll work, excuse me, I'll work on a, a composition that I want to learn. Like, if I'm trying to learn a ballad or something, I'll play that all day. I'll just put on a recorder and play it and try the different ways of approaching the composition and see if I can move myself. Like, if I can make myself cry when I'm playing, I feel like I'm, I'm doing something, you know. I try to, um, but for me, everything is about fundamentals, you know. A lot of people, <laughs> I remember, it used to be, when you, see, that building is different now. When, we, when you um, came into the, the Mass Ave building, you come down the steps, are there still steps there? So you go down the steps, and we used to have a desk right there where you would sign in. But then there was another set of steps that led to the cafeteria. But then there was these practice rooms. I think they're classes now, but it was like these like eight practice rooms. And you would have like Mark Turner be down there. I'd be here, and Chris Cheek be right here, and Seamus Blake and all these people. But you hear those people, like everybody's like playing that bad as shit. And I'm like, honk. Uh, and people are like looking at my room like, what you doing? I'm like, I'm practicing. You know, I mean, like, I'm not trying to impress you. So I think that's what you have to do. You have to be focused when, you, when you're practicing. You know, know what your deficiencies are, what you're trying to get to, and just be focused. I have a, like a notebook for myself, a, um, a moleskin notebook, and I just take notes of what I did that particular day. But, you know, I don't 
you know, and sometimes I'll, I'll play some amber songs. It depends on what my mood is. But for the most part, I start off with the long tones, and, and I go through the full range of the horn up into the altissimo range. I do it, and I do everything slow. I don't even, I don't practice fast. I can play fast, but I don't practice fast. Because a lot of people play fast, but when you slow it down, you hear all the inconsistencies and in what they're doing. So when you practice slow, your muscles are there. And when you play fast, it's not a big deal. So just focus practice and just make sure you have all the fundamentals down. Influences. Um, when I got here, I was into, like, um, Kenny Garrett. I mean, at that time, he wasn't famous yet. You know, he, he was just getting out there. He, I think they did that double take record with uh, Woody Shaw and Freddie Hubbard, and this this is prior to Miles Miles Davis, and um, I had my teacher I studied with Bill Pierce and he had me checking out um, uh, my teacher in Baltimore Gary Bartz and you know um, you know just Jackie McLean and people like that, but the teacher that really messed my world up was Andy McGee. We were in a lesson one day. He's a tenor player. He played with Lionel Hampton. He did this technique. It was like this, look, 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 right? I was like, yo, show me that. That's killing. He said, no. And I was like, no. I said, what do you mean? I said, show it to me. He said, no, you figure it out. I said, I'm paying you thousands of dollars. Show me that technique. He said, no. So I was pissed. But then I said, okay, well, let me, let me think about this. In the lesson, I said, well, okay, since he's not going to show it to me, who should I listen to to get to this technique? He said, well... I want you to listen to Johnny Hodges. I want you to listen to Bert, um, Benny Carter, to people like Earl Bostic. You know, listen to these players. And I said, okay. And where the where the bookstore is now, over here, wherever I don't know where I'm at. The bookstore. There there used to be a record store called Looney Tunes, and it was a guy named Lewis that owned it. So I went in there and I befriended this guy. I said, man, whenever you get any Johnny Hodges records or Earl Bostic, I mean, Johnny Bothwell was a, a, a Italian cat, I think, or he was like the, 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 another Johnny Hodges kind of cat. He would just turn me on to all of these things, all these records. So I, ha I still have them. I have like all the stuff that Johnny Hodges did when he left Duke Ellington. I have like, you know, him with Wild Bill Davis, the organ stuff. And I was just listening to this stuff over and over again. And it changed my world because it, it, it gave me the foundation of what the alto so saxophone was supposed to be from the beginning. And then I kind of understood how I got to Charlie Parker and Kenny Garrett and everything in between. You know, so that was like one of the best experiences that I had that teacher telling me to do the research myself. And that's when I became curious. You know, when somebody tells me something or my teacher tells me to do something, I do it, but I go deeper. You know, you know, Bill Pierce gave me a tape um, when, when I first came. Did, did you do, did he give you the tape? That I, well, you were a tenor player. Did you study with Bill Pierce? Well, it was this tape and it had like, you know, all these different alto players, Eric Dolphy and Oliver Nelson and all this stuff. And it was this one recording of blues with Jackie McLean and Gary Bartz. But it was like 15 minutes long, like a, a long blues. So am I boring you? No, I'm joking. I'm joking. So it, it was this 15-minute um, this tape. And he said, I want you to learn the solo. So I learned it, right? So he's sitting at the piano comping. And I'm playing this solo. And he's comping and I'm playing. And I'm comp and he's comp and then he turns around. And he said, "You learned the whole thing." I said, I said, "Yeah, you told me to." That's what my teacher told me to do. You know, that's that's my teachers tell me to do something. I just do it because the first of all, that's knowledge, and there's a reason why they're telling you to do that. You might not understand it in that moment, but knowledge is free, and you don't lose anything. You know, and and it was probably one of the greatest lessons. Like like I said, Andy McGee and Bill Pierce, but Joe Viola was a whole nother level too, so I'm, I was very lucky here. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to play with like all of them, you know, that were still alive, from Roy Haynes to Elvin Jones to Art Blakey, Billy Higgins, Ralph Peterson, who's here, um, Ron Savage is who's here, and Greg, and I mean, so many great drummers, but Lewis Nash, the ones that knock me out really are the ones that play dynamically, you, you know? I mean, because we have pianissimo, pianissimo, and fortissimo. Most people play forte, and they think mezzo forte is piano, you know? And I never forget playing with Roy Haynes. We were on tour, and we, he was playing so soft, but it still filled up the room. 
it was still it still felt big, you know. Or Louis Nass playing with the Dizzy Gillespie band. He's not bashing the drums, but he's still leading the section with Dennis McCrow, you know, these drummers. So I look for dynamics. I look for flexibility too, because as much as I'm a traditionalist, I I like um musicians that listen to a lot of different styles of music. You know, if you come to my house, yeah, you might hear some traditional jazz, but you might hear like Bob Marley. You might hear Amy Winehouse. You might hear whatever. You know, it depends on what I'm what I'm into at that moment. You might hear Common, who I've recorded with. You know, I just it's a it's a um, actually a famous DJ named DJ Gomi from Japan. He went to Berkeley. We just did some some house stuff that that's like being played all over Europe. You know, it's just um I I, I like flexibility. And and today, you know, as a musician today, you have to be flexible. You know, my, my love and my passion is for, for jazz, whatever that word means, because that music can be a lot of different things, you know? I, I, I love it all, but I, I want to play good music. I think my biggest example for that and the reason why I came to Berkeley was Branford Marcellus. Branford Marcellus came to Berkeley and, you know, part of that Marcellus family, I said, I have to go to this place. And he's been one of my greatest inspirations because he's not just a saxophonist, he's a musician. I mean, he's played with everybody. He played with Sting, The Grateful Dead. He's doing a lot of European classical music now. I mean, he just plays good music, and that's what I wanted to be. I want if you call me for any kind of situation, Antonio Hart's going to give it to you on a high level. But I still have to study that style of music. Just because I'm a good saxophone player doesn't mean I can get in a funk situation and sound like a funk guy. Because there's a vocabulary, there's a history, you know. Or if I'm playing ska music or reggae, or if I'm playing hip hop or anything I'm playing, I still have to study that music and listen to it so it's in the pocket. We say swinging in jazz or grooving in the pocket. Because I hear a lot of casters say, you know, I hate when guys say, um, let's play Latin. What the heck does Latin mean? What does that mean? Where is it coming from? Are you coming from Cuba? Are you coming from South America? What part of South America? Are you coming from down south, north, east, west? Different feeling. Are you coming from PR? Are you coming from Dominican Republic? You know, what is Latin? It doesn't mean anything, you know. So if you're saying that, you, you have to be, you have to be um, aware of all these things. That's why we study. So we study, we listen, we internalize, and we do it so much that when it's time to actually participate and be in the, the music, we're there. We're ready to do it. So I, I gave you a long answer. I just like flexible drummers. I like drummers that can play dynamically. I like creative drummers. I like drummers that know how to leave space. I like drummers that can just set up a groove. A lot of people feel like they just have to play because they have technique. Sometimes all I want is just a groove and just stick there, and then we can have fun. Same thing with piano players. Just because you have 32 measures of chords don't mean I need you to comp all the time. And if I'm doing something and you, and you can't hear it, don't try to go there because now you're canceling me out. You ever see videos of the Miles Davis um, quintet with um, Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, and Tony Williams? Do you ever watch that? Look, it's all on YouTube. You guys have more stuff than we had. You look... Ron Carter has his eyes closed. He's playing like this, and Tony's just all over the place. And every once in a while, Ron Carter looks at Tony. And then Herbie's just sitting at the piano like this, like with his head down. And then all of a sudden, you hear, bling, and just like, ah, you know, space. W said the beauty, WC said the beauty is in the space, and that's true. You dig? I don't always do that when I play, but you know, the space, it allows us to communicate, it allows people to digest what we do. Just like we talk. The music that we play should be how we talk, it's a communication. It's not this inanimate object of drums, a piano, a bass, or saxophone. That's, when I pick that up, I imagine that, it's, it's kind of crazy, but I imagine that all my, my, my blood vessels and everything are connected to keys. So if you, if you saw a picture of it, you would see like blood going through the, through the horn because I'm connected to it. It's like me now. I'm talking. I'm not playing a saxophone. But the only way I can get to that is because I have to, pra I mean, I have to practice and be one with that instrument. So all those fundamentals and things, I can't think about that when it's time to play. I can't think about what the harmony is when it's, time, when it's time to play. I have to know what the harmony is. I have to be listening all the time. If I'm not listening to these guys, you know what happens when you don't listen to a, a rhythm section and you're just out front playing? They become a Jamie Ambersall. They just start playing with themselves. And they plan, and, oh, he's finished? Okay. <laughs> no, it has to be interplay, you know? Now you're asking questions. Yes! 
All right, I get the young lady. Ladies first. Uh huh. I did a lot of those when I was here. When when I when I was at Berkeley, we we called them GB gigs. I did a lot of wedding gigs. I did a lot of um. Actually, I did a lot of merengue gigs. Me, Mark Turner, and Darren Barrett. We were all in merengue bands playing the Lawrence. And it was killer because we made money. I was eating steak. I wasn't a college student eating ramen. I was eating. Not. But um, <laughs> um. If you're not thinking about dance when you're playing any style of music, especially this style of music, you're not playing it. This music is a dance music. You know, it's 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 a part of the culture. A lot of the 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 rhythms and the the choruses that were written by Jimmy Lunksford and Duke Ellington and Count Basie and Chick Webb, all the stuff was based off of the dances. Some of the songs are based off of the dances. So if you're not thinking that way, if you're not feeling it. You know, in my improv class at Queens College, we have a master's program there. My first day of improv, what I have the students do is stand in the middle of the room, and I just play music, and I just sit there and watch them dance. And by the way they move their bodies, I can tell how they play music. It's, it's, it's spot on. But what I try to get them to do is, because everybody's self-conscious, you know, people looking at me, I don't know this. But after like 30 or 40 minutes, I'm saying, let go. Let go. Just let your body move to the music. Then all of a sudden, the energy in the room changes, and they start to have fun, and they, they start moving their bodies and moving around and laughing. I said, that's what it's supposed to be like on the bandstand. But we get so caught up into this. I got to play the sub. I got to play this this tritone substitution. I got to play this. I got to play this rhythm. I got to be so hip. Can you dance to that? That's the one thing that was killing about Dave Holland's band. Even though everything was in fives and sevens and all that stuff, you could still groove to it. You know, you can still feel the music. But I always tell students, too, you might not play the Vanguard. You might not play these, these big-name clubs. You might end up playing a hotel gig or wedding gigs. You won. You've won. You're playing music, and you're getting paid for it. You've won. You know? That's very important. You can only play the Vanguard once or twice a year. Can you live off of that? You know? I know guys that you've never even heard of that have big houses and cars and happy, and all they do are wedding gigs, and, and they're fulfilled with that, you know? So don't, I mean, have big dreams. Think, I mean, I want you to dream something that's almost impossible, and, but if it doesn't happen, and you're, but you're still working somewhere, no matter what gig you take, put 100% into that gig and have Thanksgiving that you're doing that because there's somebody, you know, this school is very expensive, guys, as you know. There's people that want to be in your chairs right now. They want to be where you are. You're so fortunate. So you have to be thankful for every moment. You have to be very, very thankful. I almost didn't make it through Berkeley because I couldn't afford it, and it was back then. You know, I'm very thankful. I'm very happy for you guys. Did I answer your question? I mean, fortunately for me, I haven't encountered that, what you're talking about. I mean, yeah, a lot of people have that idea of what this music is, but it's, it's up to you to say um, what's important to you and how you present your art. You know, if you accept that position that they offered and this is what they asked for, you have to give them what they asked for, you know? And if, if it goes against your belief system, then just don't do the gig. You can't, everybody has an opinion about what it is, you know? I always have and always will. But like I said, it doesn't matter what gig you're doing. I, you know, I, I go through the subway sometime in New York, and it'd be, it'd be some guy with a saxophone. He's playing all of the tune, playing the melodies wrong, but he's playing with so much soul. I mean, it's just like he's giving you everything he has. And I go in the classroom, and a student playing everything correct, but it has nothing in it. You know, 
it's got to be love. It's got to be, you know, you have to be passionate about what you do. And you got to give all the time. So for you, if, the, if you're doing those kind of jobs and it's bothering you, maybe you work with another agency or something if you can, you know, until you get to the right situation that, you know, makes your soul really sing. Yes? Yes, sir. And older musicians, oh, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious, did you ever, when you were like our age, did you ever encounter having troubles with the ego? And if so, what did you do to like balance it or kind of bring it in? Kind of, so it didn't affect your relationship too much? I put a Cannibal Adderley record on. <laughs> I mean, you know, when, when we graduated from Berkeley, when I graduated from Berkeley, I had a record contract. I was signed to RCA, and I was on, I was on the road with Roy. We were every ma every major jazz festival. We were on TV. We were on magazines. We were. It was like basically it was Winton and Branford, Donald Harrison and Terrence Blanchard, then me and Roy. We were the next two group. Yeah, we had our chest in the air. But then I listened to those recordings and I put on Cannibal Idly playing Never Will I Marry on a Pole Winners record. I'm like, I'm done. I can't do that. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm totally humbled. Or I put on Charlie Park, or shoot, I put on Johnny Hodges playing something, and, and then I'm, I'm totally humbled, you know? Ego. I think um, ego is important, or I would say confidence is important, but there's, there's a fine line. There's, there's having confidence and knowing that your ability, you're, you're capable of... Um, of doing what you need to do in any kind of situation. When it gets too far where you think you're better than anybody else, that's a little little much. And then there's the other side where you don't think you're good enough. You know, so we're always trying to balance that. So nobody's better than anybody. Like I said, when I came here, the only difference between me and you guys is just I've been here a little bit longer, but we're on the same plane where there's no, there's no difference between any of us in here. So if you find... There are people that have egos, you know, you just say, okay, that's what they're dealing with, and you decide whether you want to deal with them or not, you know? It, you, you're only responsible for yourself, you know? You can't, you can't um, base yourself on what anybody else does. If somebody thinks they're the greatest saxophone player at Berkeley and nobody else can play, I'm like, good, you're the greatest saxophone player. You know, I never thought about that, honestly. I never thought about getting a gig. I never thought about record contracts because I didn't think that was going to happen for me. I told Walter that this morning. When I came to Berkeley, I was the lowest cat on the totem pole. I would go to sessions, like I told you, and they would change keys on me, and I couldn't do it, and they'd be laughing at me, you know, like, uh, you know. I was like, okay. I just practiced. And why they didn't practice, it went like this, you know. But I, I just didn't care about all that stuff. All I wanted to do be accepted by the, the best cats in the school, and I wanted to learn as much as I could about this legacy. That's all I cared about. And then, and build relationships, and that's when all the stuff came. That's when I met Roy. I met some guys from France my first year. I went to Paris my first year at Berkeley because of some boys, I was, my boys I was hanging out with. 18 years old, poor kid from Baltimore. Never been on a plane in the air like, why am I in the air? When is this thing coming down? Next thing I know, I'm drinking red wine, you know? And like, you know, it, it's crazy, you know? I, I look back on that, and it was because of the, the relationships that I made at Berkeley and being cool with people. And I got a chance to experience another culture. That's what you guys are here. Israel, Japan, Europe, the United States. This is a, an amazing situation for you guys. And you guys, more importantly, than um, the most important thing I'm going to say to you today is your job as musicians and future musicians, you guys are like healers. You're not just musicians, you're healers. Your music should give something positive to the world and change people's life conditions and make them feel good. Right now, the world is in turmoil, but your music can make somebody feel good. Maybe you're playing one of those wedding gigs, right? It might not be your ideal gig, but people are seeing you on the bandstand having a good time. And they're like, I didn't want to come to this situation, but wow, the music. And look, they're totally enjoying themselves. Now I'm totally engaged. Or some, somebody's coming from work and just going to get a beer, and they, they just had a horrible day, and your music just makes them feel good. Or somebody comes to your concert, and they fall asleep. That's not disrespect. Your music made them feel good and relaxed them so they can feel good. You got to think that you got to give. We're of service to humanity. 
And because you're here and you're at Berkeley College of Music, that means you're, you're supposed to be the best of the best. And you have to be thinking beyond just playing music. But what are you going to give back to society because, and give back to, 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 to the universe because you've been given so much? It's all about giving. It's all about giving back. All about giving back. It's all about giving back. It's all about being of service. It's all about being of service. Yes. I mean, that's the most important thing is making sure I, I, I understand the music. I've studied the music and I've listened to whatever they they put out. So conceptually, I'm, I'm in the ballpark. And then I'm just a sponge. I'm just open to any kind of critiques that they have for, for what they want. You know, when I was in a Dizzy band for like 13 years, I was in the band for like 27 years, 26, 7 years. And for 13 years, I sat next to Frank West, one of the greatest of all times. And he, he you know, he'd be like, no vibrato, cut that note off, da, 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 you know, like that. That's all he would say to me, and I'd be like, yes, sir, you know. But then I would just watch him. I would watch him put his horn together. I would watch how he sat in the chair. I would watch his mouth around the mouthpiece when he used vibrato. I just used, that was, you know, my thing. But I'm just respectful to the situation. As a side man, your job is to help the band leader reach that vision. So whatever they ask you to do when you accept that gig, you do it, you know, humbly. You know, as long as they're respectful about it, you know, but you just you just want to be in that situation, be prepared and, and allow them, like I said, allow their vision to grow and be a part of that. Sometimes you have to be an Indian and then other times you're a chief. I'm definitely a chief. But when I'm with Dave Holland, when I'm with those guys, I'm an Indian and, and I'm fine with that. Let me get, get you. Yes. Keep playing. One of my heroes, Gary Bartz, for me, one of the greatest musicians on earth and of all times. When I listen to him, I, 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 say, I call him, I say, Master Bartz, it seems like you always play a perfect solo. You know, like you never play too much, you never play too little, your development is incredible. And when I'm practicing, I'm practicing all this stuff and I'm trying to get it out. And I'm like, he said, Antonio, he said, just do it. And as you, as you get older, as you get mature, you learn to pick and choose. So some of it, you know, we want stuff really fast. You know, we, we want it in the moment. But some things are just going to take time. And what you have to do is just empty your cup. You know, if you're, if, as long as you're practicing, you're consistent, you're going to get there. And the beauty of it, you want to be here, right? And you're here now. You have all this beautiful journey to get there. And once you get here, that becomes this. You know, it's the same thing over and over again. So we all do that. But the most important thing is that you hear, you know. So anything that you, anything that you play, you want to be able to hear. James Moody used to tell me that all the time. He says you, be able, you should be able to sing it. I can't sing all the stuff that I play, but I can hear it, you know, sitting at this thing. This is the full orchestra. This is probably the most important thing for all of us, you know. So you see harmony, melody, all these things. But the key to it is just to play. You know, and think about it. I always tell my students there's four things that you need to do. The first thing is listen. That's more important than anything else. You listen, and then you practice, and then you play. That's going to sessions and playing. And then you go back and think about it, and you do it over and over again. You listen, you practice, you think about it, and you play. And you just continue to do that. And then there's three ways of learning. First, you understand the concept that you're trying to learn. Secondly, you practice it for accuracy. Third, where you can do it any way you want. You know, so what you're going through, everybody goes through it, every last one of us. And it, it changes as you get older, you know. Just the thing is just to be consistent and practice. The fact that you're thinking about it, that's what you do when you, when you listen to your recordings. What am I not hearing? What am I not executing? 
And then when you go play, it's your laboratory. When you do these sessions, that's your laboratory. You practice and you say, okay, let me, let me consciously, I'm going to work on this idea or I'm just going to play melodies. Can I hear melodies? I'm just going to play this and that, you know, but just be consistent. Yes. You know what? One more and um, maybe get some, some guys to play before you go. Yes. Mm -hmm. What happened was my I went to Queens College because I, I was going to get the master's, but I wanted to study with a, a master. Um, and and I, I knew at the time that uh, Jimmy Heath was there and Professor Donald Byrd. I was like, well, there it is. And my goal was to have Master Heath not just be my teacher. I wanted to have a serious relationship with him. Like now he's like my father. Like we're, we're, we're like this. But it took a little time. I had to develop a relationship, right? So um, I ended up going to Queens, and I, I graduated, but I was on the road with Hargrove at the time. So I got my master's and toured and for many years. And when he retired, another gentleman came in. His name is Todd Williams. He's a tenor player that was with Wynton Marcellus. And Todd stayed for a couple years, but he wanted to go into something else. So they called Mr. He said, would you come in for the summer? Because he called like in August. School was getting ready to start. He said, will you come in? So I came in as a visiting artist professor. And I was kind of tired of the road. I had my band on the road, and, and it, was, it was hard. And I said, well, let me, let me just take a little break. And it went from visiting artist professor to full-time to now I got my tenure. I'm, I actually, I'm, the, I'm the, the, the chair of the department now, you know. I don't like that part, but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a blessing. It's a lot of hard work. So um, that's, that's how it happened. Through relationships, I got the job at Queens College. Who wants to play something? Who has their horns? Get your horn out. Come on. I told you guys to get your horns out when I first started. We supposed to be ready. Why are they doing any more questions? Cool. Yes, sir. My favorite albums? Of this year? That came out this year? I don't know, man. Um, honestly, all I've been listening to lately is I bought this Columbia Miles Davis box set. It's like 70 CDs. That, that's, that's all I've been listening to. That, I switched between Miles Davis and Bartok. So I have a complete Bartok box set. So honestly, the new music, I know Robert came out with something new. Glasper came out with some new stuff. Um, I, you know, I... I I need to have my ear a little bit more on what the, the younger guys are doing, which I promised myself I would do. So I, I haven't, like I said, I haven't really heard a lot of the new stuff. Maybe you can turn me on before I leave, and then I'll be into it. What did somebody turn me on? No, that's not new, but Yvonne Lenz, like stuff I haven't heard before. I just started checking out stuff. Come on up on the bandstand, guys. Yeah. How you feeling? All right, so. I'm gonna try, uh, I'm gonna try a little experiment. So, this is, um, this is something that I do with my students in class, and this is, this is something that's very, very important. Um, a lot of times, I, I know all these guys are capable, they can play probably more stuff than me on their instruments, but. We want to talk about how to play melody. Just play melody, all right? So I'm going I'm to take you through a few steps of what I tell my students, and maybe this might enlighten you to some things and make you think differently about playing melody. Do you know, do you know body and soul? How long you been at Berkeley? Okay, all right. That's okay. Do you know body and soul? Okay, you know body and soul? You know body and soul? Okay, good. All right, so what you're going to do, you're going to hear the melody, all right? So we're going to start with you. Don't go nowhere. We're going to start with you. Young. What's your name? Katie. Katie, come on over, Katie. So what I want you to do is just play the melody for me with the rhythm section, body and soul. Let me, let me sit the piano for a second. One, second. One, two, three. Thank you. 
melody, really beautiful. What are you thinking about when you're playing the melody? Well, right now I'm trying not to mess up. <laughs> and if you mess up, this is the place to mess up because you're, yeah, yeah. you're 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 in your laboratory and you're you're safe. So don't worry about that. But what do you what do you other than that? What are you thinking about? I'm not really. Okay, that's honest. Mm -hmm. So. We're seeing this song for the first time, Body and Soul. You've played it before. The first thing, we have to figure out how we're going to play it, right? There's, there's not like in European classical music where everything is through composed, where we see articulations, we see everything written out for us. We have to do that. That's the genius of what we do as jazz musicians. But think about the arc of the melody. When I say the arc, when it goes up, when it comes down. When music goes up, what usually happens, guys? It's loud. What happens? I need you to talk like musicians. When music goes up, what happens? That's not music. That's not a music term. What happens when music goes up? There's a crescendo. When music goes down, they crescendo. That's how you have to talk. This is our language, right? We can say go loud, but it's, it's crescendo. So I want you to think about that melody. Now we have a long note. We have to think about what do we want to do with that note. Are we going to just have that note flat line? Are we going to put color on it, vibrato? Are we going to do something dynamically to breathe life into that note? Right? Yeah. Let's do it again. Please. One, two. Don't mess up, OK? I'm joking. One, two, three, four. stopping a lot guys oh okay so what what is the highest note that you play so far your C right your constant E flat right so that's our destination but you play nothing's there no follow my hand okay look at me when I when you play and just when I go like this that I want you to not get loud I want you to crescendo and when I go like this I want you to crescendo okay one two soft no, follow me. Sad and lonely for you, die for dear only. See, this is important. When you know the words, I don't know the words every song, but it gives you the meaning for you. You're the only person. For you, dear only. Really? You don't care about me. I'm <laughs> sad and lonely for you, I sigh for you. So the, the expression, the meaning, right? One, two, three, soft, four. <laughs> That's the melody. Without 
out without all the fancy stuff. Now, check this out. One, two, three, four. <laughs> dynamics. Yeah. Also, I did some glissando bends. That's Johnny Hodges, right? Yeah. Tradition. One, two, three, four. So. think about that. I always, my students get mad at me because I talk about what's most important. We can learn every scale, we can learn everything about music, but if you're not thinking about dynamics, you're not thinking about articulation, you're not thinking about space, you're not thinking about sound and color, there's nothing. It's just a black note. Maybe I want it to be red. Maybe I want it to be blue. Maybe I want it to be pizza. Maybe I want it to be a hot dog. Maybe I want it to be hummus. Maybe I want it to be sober. You know, maybe I want it to be rainy day, a sunny day, hot and cold. The, the note is what you put on the note, how you play the note. So what I what I need you to do, every ballad that you know, I want you to listen to the original version. It was recorded in 1939 or something, or in the early 30s. Listen to how it was played by the composer right away. And then you listen to Miles Davis and you listen to Charlie Parker and all those people, how they play it. Or the most famous solo, 1939. 1939? Thank you. You're supposed to know it. And you're supposed to know it. Yeah. You know it? You know it? I, I can play it. But you can play it? No. Then you don't know it. Right? <laughs> this is, you know, this is old school. You know, like the old cats. When I remember we, we did this picture for Time, Time Magazine, and it was all these, Illinois Jaquette, Michael Brecker, all these people were still, I was standing right next to Joe Henderson. And they were singing Flying Home. Everybody in the room was singing Flying Home solo. You know, because that's what we did. I'm in my office with my, my private students, and I'm singing these solos, these cannonball solos. I'm like, bit, bo, ba, bidu, bidu, bida, ba, ba, do, ba, do, bi, ba, 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 da, ba, ba, da, ba, ba, do, di, ba, da, do, do, ba, do, bi, di, bo, bi. I'm waiting for y'all to join me. Who knows it? Yeah, I know the song, but do you know cannonball solo? You can sing it? Yeah. Let's go. One, two. One, two, three, four. Beep, boom, beep, boom. Go. Uh huh. Don't ask me if it's right. Singing that solo, I can't just sit here and be like, bit, no, bit, 
Go bop, pew, ba do, ba da. That's the swing. That's the groove. The articulation. That's the life. That's it. That's why we learn solos. That's why we transcribe. The notes are not that important. Notes are good for learning vocabulary. But it's how did Coleman Hawkins play body and soul? How did he play those notes? How did he articulate? How did he play in different registers? So you get the spirit of that person. You feel that person. So you could play, I, it's, not, it's not Coleman Hawkins, but I'm playing in the spirit of Coleman Hawkins or John Coltrane or Don Bias or whoever you're listening to. You guys got to listen more. That's the most important thing, listening. We get so caught up in schools of all this information. Information is good. We got to feel the music. We got to dance to the music. You can be in your room by yourself. You don't have to worry about anybody. But yeah, go ahead, Cannon. Uh, ooh, you know? That's it. Okay, let's get back to the body and soul. I got to learn that solo. <laughs> One, two, three, four. <laughs> song is what? A-A-B-A, -A -A, right? So you just you just played the first A. And pretty much the second A is a repetition, a repeating of the second A. But something has to be different. So say the first A we started on the first floor. Okay. Then the second A we're going to start on the second floor. So just a little bit more. Okay? First A. Two, three, four, one. <laughs>
Straight no chaser. What key are you doing it in? It's usually an F, but you can do it in any key. We might do all 12 keys. Nah, just F. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three. Stop. Is that how we start the song? The most important thing is how we start a song and how we end it. I counted it off, so we should be ready to play, right? One, two, one, two, three. Thank you. 
movie had no life in it. That, that melody was like, la, 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 la. music has to have life in it. Everybody on the stage is, you guys are good musicians. We got a lot of homework to do. Like, because I'm not hearing a lot of the history, a lot of the vocabulary, you know? Your solo was interesting. You played way too long, though. I mean, you got four other people. It's like being respectful to the situation, you know? Doesn't matter. It's funny. We did a jam session in that room, Mark Turner, right? Mark Turner took a solo, and I was sitting there looking at my watch. I left the session, went up to the dorm, <laughs> did something in my dorm, came back, and he was still solo. I was like, come on, Mark. Come on, man. I mean, everybody wants to play, so it happens, right? You know, and Lord knows I played a long time in my band. But when you got a lot of people, a couple courses is enough. You're a great musician. You played the heck out of that clarinet. So without a doubt, there's some very interesting stuff going on. Um, I kept on looking at you on the drums. You're a great drummer, too. Dynamics. Mm -hmm. You know? What you're hearing on that side is not what we're hearing on this side. So you, and you, it was good that you dropped down when the clarinet player was playing. But you have to think about every person, right? Dynamics. Hearing. You weren't listening. She, she started playing something else, and you were into your own thing. So when she was doing the harmony, and I'm like, you gotta, we gotta be engaged. It's a rhythm section. It's not you playing piano, bass, and drums. You're one person. So ears is our most important tool as a musician, listening. Going back and listening to the early musicians, that's what I would say for all of you guys. You gotta really build your foundation. Dizzy Gillespie said, one foot in the past, one foot in the present, you know? I know you guys are listening to what's happening now, but I can hear from every last one of you guys, you gotta go back. Marshall Royal, Johnny Hodges, Benny Carter, Tad Smith, Earl Bostic is gonna change your world. Chew Berry, Don Bias, Lester Young, all these people that we talk about before you get to Dexter Gordon and then you transition to the next guys. There's a reason why we talk about those names and you have to know that as students of the music. Same thing with Jimmy Hamilton and, and of course Goodman and people like that. You wanna you wanna listen to the history as well as listening, you know, to all the all the stuff that's current, you know? It's very, very important that we have the history in our playing. When we played that melody, what is the melody you doing? It's, it's telling you what to do. So why aren't you doing it? Melody, one, two, one, two, three. What we listen for. That's why you put on your favorite records and you listen to it over and over again. Why? Because it makes you feel something. When you play, you have to feel something. I know where you are in your stage because we're learning a lot of stuff, but I want you guys, just, just as a visitor, start to think about music more. Think about the music you continue to listen to. It doesn't have to be jazz, but why am I listening to it over and over again? What are the elements that make me want to listen to Kind of Blue a trillion times? Wow. Okay. Um, so back to what I was saying. <laughs> Guys, you're supposed to be y'all supposed to be nailing that one. That's like it's the most selling record of all times. I had a student the other day. I was like, um, we're gonna play flamingo sketches. What record is that on? I mean, excuse me, we're recording is on. He's like, I don't know. And I was like, <laughs> unfathomable, right? But we got we got to study. Your teachers are your guides, or, or your coaches are your guides. So you trust them. The teachers that they have at the school are the best in the world. And they have them here for a purpose. But their responsibility is to lead you. Your responsibility is to yourself to go further. You know, Antonio Hart came. You might not agree with everything that Antonio Hart said. 
But Antonio Hardy has been out here for 30 years playing with the best of the best ever. So he obviously knows a little bit of something. Not ego. Just It's just truth. You know? And I want you guys to have this. When we were here, I'm telling you, when we were students here, this is what we did. We listened to all those records. We sang the solos together. We, we sat in the practice room. We practiced and we transcribed. And we, wanted to, we just wanted to play. We wanted to, like, just be in it, you know? We wanted to be a part of this great fraternity. You want to be a part of that. You're already you're walking in the door, but you have to be prepared, you know? More vocabulary. More vocabulary. Studying is very important. Listening. Playing every day. You got to play every day, seven days a week. You got to be engaged. You got to be obsessed with the music. It has to be something that you have to do, like going to the bathroom, like brushing your teeth. It's like you have to love it that much. That's, that's, that's why we have Charlie Parkers. That's why we have John Coltrane and all the things. That's why we have Walter Smith and people like that. I'm not juicing on him. He's a bad cat. I listen to his records all the time. He's a bad cat. You know? <laughs> You have to love it, period, you know? If you love it, you'll do that. You'll do, you'll stay up. Sometimes you won't even eat. You know, you'll just study the records. One of, one of Wayne Shorter's records, Highlight. You know that record, Highlight? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I listen to that record every day for six months. Every day, because there's something, it's so much in there. Or, you know, Juju, all those records, all the Charlie Parker records. All the Duke Ellington stuff. I listen to all that stuff. As well as Bob Marley. As well as, like I said, Amy Winehouse. As well as the Rolling Stones. As well as Jeff Beck. I listen to a lot of different music. As well as Concerto for Orchestra. Bartok is one of my favorite pieces. Stravinsky. Debussy. Delius. We have to, we're students of music, so we have to listen. So we have frame of reference. When you listen to the orchestras, that's all that dynamics. That's all that space. That's all that color. That's where we put our music. Charlie Parker and those guys... My teacher, Jimmy Heath, told me he would go to the library with, with John Coltrane, and they would listen to Stravinsky and all that stuff together. There's recordings of Charlie Parker playing etudes. It's on, it's on YouTube. And he talks about that. If the masters did it, we're supposed to do that. You know? So it's just all I can say to you is you guys sound good, but you got you to work. You got to work a lot harder. Learn the melody. Listen to the singers, Ella Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday, Carmen McRae, Sarah Vaughn, Frank Sinatra. Any of the singers, hear the words of the songs. That will help you a lot. And then when you play it, you'll hear it. You know? Listen to Don Bias and, and Lester Young and Coleman Hawkins and everybody else that you like to listen to. If you like Potter or whoever's out there now, who did he listen to? Then who did that person listen to? And go as far back so I can't go any further. So I start with Johnny Hodges, but I don't start with Johnny Hodges. I start with Sidney Bechet. Sidney Bechet. He was a clarinet player before he played soprano, right? And if you listen to early Johnny Hodges, he played just like Sidney Bechet. And then you move your, you work your way up until you get to the players that up today. Same thing with piano. You got to go back. Jelly Roll Morton. You got to work your way to Art Tatum, Fats Waller, Willie the Lion Smith, Scott Joplin. You should be able to play all the stride piano, right time. Monk, Thelonious Monk was a, was a um, stride pianist. You know that already, right? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right? Jimmy Blanton. You got to go back. Shadow Wilson and all the early stuff when they were just playing wood blocks before they had the hi-hats. That stuff is important because that's the evolution of our instruments, you know? That's how we play the music. And it's got to be with some spirit. It's got to be with some love, you know? Questions from you guys? I scared y'all. <laughs> y'all lucky. I ain't gonna teach you here. No, I'm joking. <laughs> huh? Here's a question. Oh, yes, sir. Thanks, Katie. Yeah. Um, there is a. You know, we spoke to a lot of things that uh, all of us as kids on the stage here need to focus on in their playing. Even me. All of us. Yeah, all of us. There's so much out there. How, how, what do you What do you do immediately when you go into practice? Do you narrow it down to the things? It's daunting. It's too much. You say I always have my students have like a uh, like a notebook. I wish I had one here. And so you have Monday through Sunday. Maybe Sunday you take the day off, right? That might be just a listening day. But say Monday, Wednesday, and Friday you have 
three or four bullet points that you cover. And then the other, other days, the other three days, you have this, and then you just mark it off as you go. But if you try to do everything in one day, it's just too much. Because long tones, for me, long tones takes me 45 minutes. You know, by the time I do my scales in thirds, four, fifth, six, and sevens, and do my triads and all that stuff, that's, a, that's more than an hour, almost an hour and a half before I, before I can move on to anything else. And then I do etudes for another 45 minutes. And I'm not even talking about playing anything jazz wise, I'm just talking about fundamentals, you know? So maybe that's what I do on one day. The other day, I might go in my office and say, you know, I just want to take this song through all 12 keys. Can I do it? You know? And then I practice that. And then I practice in the keys that give me a problem. Okay, you know, I might stay in one key for a month. That's what I used to do when I was here. You know, like all of the guitar string keys, the E's, the A's, and I would just play in that key for a month where I can start to hear in that key. You know, because each key for me is like a person and they have a different personality. I can say, I can play the same voice. And I can play this. same voicing but it's a different personality so for me when I when I think of keys they're totally different people you know so you should work out your practice routine that way that's what I think that's why I have success with my students because I give them a lot of stuff I mean this is just this is nothing you know they have a lot of things that they have to work on but you have to what I'm good at I, I bring it up but what I'm not good at that's what I focus on be honest Jimmy Heath told me he said he said Antonio you know why John Coltrane was great and I was like, why, Master Heath? He said, because he, he never ran away from his deficiencies. When they did two bass hit, you know that song, right, with Miles Davis? Yes? How's the melody go? <laughs> yeah, right? So that's a blues in D-flat concert. And, and Mr. Heath said John Coltrane practiced for six months in D-flat. And if you listen to that recording, he's nailing it. Cannonball is nailing it too, but John Coltrane is really like destroying it. You know, it's how bad did you want it? How bad do you want it? And you'll put in the time. You know, listening, guys. For, for what I need you guys to do is just listen more. Everybody has like terabytes of music. You have Spotify. You have YouTube, but you have to listen. Just pick one album and know the whole album. Know everybody's solo. Know the piano player, the bass player, the drums. Know everything that's going on for one record. But the whole recording, that's what, that's what we used to do. Because we didn't have as much information as that. We used to have tapes. We, there used to be a tower. It used to be tower records. Like, what is it, TJ Maxx now? It was, that was tower records. And we would buy these big boxes of, of uh, TDK tapes, like 70. It was, it was like, take all your money. And we would just get everybody's records and we would record them. And we just tape, just, just you know. Just um, listen to those tapes all the time. And I had them for many years. I, I went to Cuba and I gave them to all the musicians in Cuba, you know, because they didn't have access to that stuff. But it saved my life. You got to listen all the time. You got to be engaged. Is, is, there's no way around it. If this is what you want to do as a career, you have to love it. You have to love it. Yes, sir. You can do both. I mean, you definitely gravitate towards the things that interest you. But as a student of the music, you should study the history of the music. You should know. I mean, and, and if you want to go even deeper, like um, I had my students watching, because um, I have a lot of students from Korea and different parts of Europe, and they, they know about jazz via schools, but they don't understand about the culture in which this music comes from. So I had them watch a series called Eyes on the Prize which deals with the civil rights movement. And, and, and this was dealing from 1951 to 1955. There was a lot of jazz being created in that period. Charlie Parker and those guys were alive. And I was like, when this was going on, when this was happening, Charlie Parker and, John, and, and Dizzy Les were playing at the Three Deuces. You know, this music, is, is, it came out of a condition of a people. It wasn't just something they did in the classroom or something they sat at the piano and created. It was, it was a response to what was happening socially, economically, and politically. That's the next thing. That's how art is created. The music that you create today should be saying something about what's happening today in the world. You know, so, yes, chronologically, I, I'm, I'm an advocate for that. 
But also, like I said, there were things that I, even though I was listening to Johnny Hodges, and all that, I was still checking out Ken, uh, Kenny Garrett and all the stuff that was happening at the time, Gary Thomas and those people, because it was interesting to me, Robin Eubanks. But I knew after um, Andy McGee played that technique, I was like, I want that. Yes. Do both. You got to do both. I know, I mean, you hear Robert Glasper and Casey Benjamin and Kamasi Washington. I know all those guys well. I knew Robert and those guys went over to new school with Bilal. They were playing standards. They were playing straight ahead jazz at the jam sessions. I mean, what they're playing now is more of an R&B vibe. I remember when all the guys went out with Lauryn Hill and all that stuff. You know, they wanted to communicate with their generation, but they're, they're very good instrumentalists in a traditional sense. They just chose to play a certain way. Brian from Marcellus did the same thing, you know, and we know he can play. I just I just subscribe to that Dizzy Gillespie thing of having one foot in the past and one foot in the present. I, I need to be more in the present because I don't know a lot of the young players in terms of their recordings. I've heard them, a lot of them. There's one um, alto player that's just ridiculous, Godwin. Godwin, he's, he's super incredible. You know, um, cert, you know, so I have an ear for the guys that knock me out. Um, but you just you gravitate towards what you like, but you want to have the foundation. When I listen to a player, honestly, I don't want to hear John Coltrane. I got the records. I don't want to hear Charlie Parker. I got the records. You're not going to sound any better than that, and you don't, you don't have his experience. Or even, you know, now with Tia Fuller and, and um, uh, uh, Caddy Rodriguez and Sherelle Cassidy and all these people, my little sisters, you know, some wonderful female musicians that always have been out there, but now they're getting some attention. So you're, you, there's great, great examples for you. You know, you want to just listen to everything, listen to what's happening now, and also just, just build your foundation. Just do it together. Anybody else? Good. Yeah, guys, so um, melody, being melodic. It's not about just the, the things that you play. Hearing melodies, like you said, hearing, hearing what you play, being more melodic, space like you did, dynamics like you did, how you articulate. We practice technique. You should do some more like um, technical things, like some some of the etudes and things like that, just to get your fingers locked up. There are many books. I'll I'll tell you later. But I can see now you you could work you know with a metronome slowly, so your fingers are a little more relaxed, right? Um, same thing, you could you could do it with a little more technique too. You know, just you only need next technique just to get your ideas across. But just just listening, I, I didn't really hear you flow. And same thing, vocabulary, more vocabulary, so you can I can hear what's going on. You know, vocabulary, melody, dynamics, space, articulation, love, love. When you play, like you did. When you play, people want to enjoy you. People want to feel you. So when you play, it's your shining hour. It's your shining hour. And you just have to go. You have to go for it. Okay, let's, um, let's play one more song and then uh, get out of here, I guess. How we doing, Walter? Wow, really? Yeah. <laughs> all right. We're going old school on y'all. Cherokee, let's go. Y'all better not mess up the melody. Eight measures out front drums. One, two, one, two, a one, two, three, four.
old school Berkeley. All 12 keys at Wally. All 12 keys. But I'm not thinking it's not a big deal. It's just practicing. Nothing I'm doing is it's just for vocabulary. I'm playing a specific vocabulary for you guys. That's what we're supposed to know. It can go further. I can stress the harmonies. It's not important. What I want you guys to see is like Charlie Parker, all that stuff that's in there. We got to know that. If you call yourself a jazz musician, you might not choose to play like that, but you're supposed to know that. If you want the respect from the these kind of cats, from the Walter Smiths and the Bill Pierces, and, and you, you want to be a part of that fraternity. The only way you can join that fraternity, you got to go through that period and earn your spot in that, in that fraternity. You got to sound great. Thank you for putting up with me. You know, um, I love this music, guys. I, I love this with all my heart. It's given me so much. If I could just give you a picture of how I grew up and for me to be here in front of you guys, the places that I've been around the world many, many times because of this thing right here, I would have never guessed it. Never. This horn right here, this was a gift from the company. You know what I mean? And I have several of them. That's a, that's a blessing from God, you know? If it can happen for me, I want it to happen for you, and you, and you, and you. But you gotta do the homework. You gotta be good people. You gotta be professional. You gotta be on time. You have to be, you have to be on top of everything. Playing your instrument is just the beginning of it. You have to be able to write. You have to be able to arrange. You have to know how to teach, because a lot of you guys are gonna teach. You gotta do a lot, you gotta wear a lot of different kinds of hats, and you have to be very good at all of them. Berkeley has everything you want to learn. Their materials are, I mean, around the world, everybody wants to study the stuff in Berkeley. If you really master this material, when you go back to where you come from, you've already made yourself very, very valuable. Don't waste your four years here or how long you're here. Use this time, meet people, study, get all your information. The stuff that you don't master in the four years, have your notebook so you can do that later. Great ahead. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.